laptops available for students who are having um, trying to make outputs on the board. So, all right, so it is quarter two, week nine, and again, next week is the end of the quarter. Um, this Friday is the reminder check. Next Friday is the last chance for test amendments and to make up any tests you may have missed. Um, today we're talking about skeletal anatomy physiology. And yesterday there were a few of you that still seemed a bit, um, that still seemed a bit unsteady on some familiar terms we've been exploring throughout the quarter. So, um, are pieces of the body. Um, but we have learned about more than the body's parts. Um, we haven't just written down their name. We've also talked about some other things. Um, so for physiology, it is the functions of excellent, right? Uh, remember that these terms, you need to be proficient with them in order to effectively navigate the mid-year as well as the MCAS. Um, so as I mentioned, the mid-year today is our last note-taking presentation of um, quarter two, and the last thing we'll be taking notes on before the mid-year, which is um, two Tuesdays from now, so two weeks from now. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about our start question here. Is it easier to push something rigid or soft? What is it when something is rigid? What does that adjective imply about it? Right? That it is hard, that it is firm, that it is solid. Um, right, the contrast of soft. So let's say I have two objects of an equivalent size, right? Maybe the size of a refrigerator, right? One of them is the refrigerator, it's metal, it's a large, heavy object. The other is the same size, same shape, but it's like a bean bag, it's a big squishy thing. And I have to move it across, move them across the room. Which one can I exert force on and have it slide more easily as force is exerted? Oh, Nathan. So I've got my two large objects, one is soft, one is hard. If I put pressure on each one of them, which one is going to slide easier? Which one's going to move? The one that's which? So if I put all the pressure of my hands into the soft one, what happens to that object? Hmm? All right, so it perhaps could fall, or we're saying it's like a squishy bean bag kind of a thing. Or I could push it, it could change shape. But if I apply force against a solid object, what happens to that object? It stays the same. It stays the same. Where will the energy go? Yeah, it'll move, right? So we're thinking about that. Things that are stiff, things that are firm, are actually easier to move. The energy we put on them causes them to uh, transforms into motion, whereas the energy uh, applied to a soft object might cause it to change shape. So. Um, all right, now to really put someone in the hot seat. So, um, G squared. Um, how does how does this idea of being able to push something solid um, relate to this? What is our body like? Is our body a, just a squishy, amorphous blob on the floor, or do we have a frame? We have a frame, right? And our frame is, of course, the the skeleton. Great. And what pulls on the skeleton to make us move? We have our bones. What's pulling on the bones to make movement happen? The muscles, right? So this is in some ways a review from yesterday, remembering that our bones act as anchors, as pulleys, um, to create movement in our body as muscles pull on them. All right, cool. Let's uh, get a new friend. Um, Jairo, could you read our quote for us? Maybe say a little more about it. Always learning more. Always have being hard things. All right, um, so yeah, always learn morals by heart. They have to become the marrow in your bones. 
Um, what's a moral? What is it when you have morality? Please, Dana. Like, is it more like, like the whole topic of the life? Or the, the, the idea of the moral of the story? Sure. But when we say that somebody is a moral person, what are we saying about them? Or maybe true to themselves? Are they someone who does the right thing or the wrong thing more often than not? Right. The right thing, right? They do the thing that is considered moral, that is considered just, that is considered true. Um, so where is marrow in respect to your bones? Is it on the surface? Is it in the middle? Is it on the deepest part? It's the deepest, right? The marrow is the core of your bone. Right, so just think about this idea of making morals the core of your existence. So that you're always doing the right thing. And of course, what we talked about in our homeostasis check-in, doing the right thing yields to happiness and success in life. All right, um, the homework you'll notice is a bit of an extension in that last night you did questions one and two from these pages, and now you're continuing on to do four to six, so you're not doing number three. You do have a different set of pages to read in order to be effective in answering these questions. So go ahead and put four through six on one and twos, the same page, and staple it all together and hand it to me on Thursday. So um, if you didn't have an opportunity to do one and two last night, you still have a chance to make that happen before Thursday. All right, so everyone's ready to go. I'm getting dirty looks. Am I going to have a bad lunch or something? All right, so we're going to really grumpy look on everyone's face. All right, so um, we're going to talk about the three types of skeletons to start us off. There are three different ways that skeletons are represented on Earth that we've discovered so far. There could be more. We never know what's at the deepest part of the ocean that we haven't um, been able to explore yet. But so far we can talk about these three types. The first being the type of skeleton we have, which is known as an endoskeleton. Where is our skeleton? Is it on the inside or outside of our body? Inside. Inside, right? So the prefix endo indicates internal or inside. Right, so we have what's known as an internal skeleton. The framework of our body, the sculpture, the uh, the building is all on the inside of a soft layer of tissues, right? It's below our skin. Um, much of it is below muscle. An advantage of having an endoskeleton is that you can move a lot faster, right? You're not covered in a huge, heavy suit of armor. Um, so it allows you to run a little quicker. And also because much of your body is supple, is soft, it also allows you to change shape, right? So having an endoskeleton, having your soft tissue on the outside also allows you to be a little more dynamic and flexible. Um, now, however, I don't want us to be misled by this idea that the endoskeleton is always the most deep inner thing. For example, if I draw this object, Right, and hopefully we all know what that is. Um, right, we have a bone here, part of the endoskeleton. Are there soft tissues? Are there squishy organs inside of this thing? Is there anything inside of that skull? The brain. The brain, right? So in this example, we're actually saying the endoskeleton is on the outside of the soft tissues. So how is it we can still consider it a skeleton? What's the what's the skull wrapped in? Skin, right? So because you still have skin on the outside, the skull would still be considered part of your endoskeleton structure. It's still enveloped. It's not bone that's exposed out into the world. Um, let's say, for example, an another deviation from this um, sentence. If I talk about the rib cage, well, I can try to do that. So. Um, Eddie, what does the rib cage protect? What two organs? And So it still fits into our endoskeleton description. 
Um, all right, so now other organisms have what's known as an exoskeleton, like the word exit, as in outside. Right, so an exoskeleton is a framework on the outside, on the external surface of the organism. Um, and all of the soft tissues are on the inside. So all of the organs, all of the tissues, all of the membranes um, are located within a shell. Now obviously an advantage to this is that you're not easily punctured or damaged by impact. Right, so if you are a crab or a beetle, Right, you have a shell around you, an armor. But unlike our endoskeleton, it's not flexible. So as we grow, our bones grow with us. Right? We've got the same skeleton we had when we were kids. But for organisms that have exoskeletons, they have to go through a process called molting. And uh, you may have heard about molting before with snakes or other organisms. What is it when an organism molts? Sheds. It sheds, right? It removes its skin. So in order for a crab to grow, what the crab actually has to do is break out of its current shell, and then it fluffs itself up a little bit and rehardens. Now, most of the time that shell serves it very well, but in the process of molting, in the process of growing that new shell, it has a very sensitive period. Um, what's very like, what could happen to a crab during that time when Some it's all soft and squishy? It could get crushed or it could get eaten. Or it could get eaten, right? So, cra so animals with exoskeletons have to find a place to hide when they're doing their molting because they are vulnerable to attack. All right, and last up, we have our hydrostatic skeleton. We've got some good stuff here to discuss based on that. Um, Alvin, the word hydro indicates? Water, awesome. And static, just like stasis, is a word we've discussed a few times. So thinking about homeostasis, Tiffany, um, what does it mean to be static? Staying the same, right? Um, so, awesome. Right, so an uh, organism that's a hydrostatic or a, or a water-stable skeleton has a fluid-based skeleton, a skeleton that is soft, flexible, but is on the outside, right? So it's kind of, it has elements of each. It's like an exoskeleton in that it is the outer part of the body. <laughs> Um, and it is like an endoskeleton in that it is highly flexible. Um, worms fit into the category of hydrostatic, as do slugs and snails. Uh, so, who's ever held a worm before? What? Who's ever held a worm before? Like on the ground, pick it up. Right. Uh, yeah. You can tell. You know, it's it's got a it's it's got a bit of a shell like feel to it. Like it's a firm thing, but. Obviously, it's a very wiggly thing, right? All right, let's talk about a little dilemma here. Um, I can't see it very well. Um, hold on, I'll take all that back stuff off the first. No one wants that stuff anyways. Um, all right, so let's say I have an animal that looks like this. Hopefully, everyone can identify that animal. I like turtles. All right, so. Um, I'm gonna put right there a skull. Oops, wait. And then, just like us, it has a rib cage, and then there's its vertebrae, and there's its ribs, and just like us, it has arms and leg bones. All right, so which category would this organism fit under? Right, so it has a skull and it has arm bones inside of its skin, but then it also has a hard exterior. Um, so this is a, its actual its spine that runs along the inside of its shell. So what do we think? Is it is it more like an endoskeleton or more like an exoskeleton? It's more endo, right? The majority of the bones still being on the inside you still consider it an endoskeleton, but it has elements of the exoskeleton, of course. Um, what about... What about this guy? Gary. All right, so, um, so what about this guy here, endo or exo? That's still an exoskeleton, yeah. Right, so it has this large hard surface, 
And then this part of its body would be, would have this hydroskeleton. So, so notice that some animals are deviant from our original list and do have a mixture of things going on. All right, cool. All right, so next up, we're gonna talk about um, the ways skeletons are held together. Skeletons are what are known as connective tissue. They're things that bind and hold the body together, yes. Are made of cartilage. Um, yeah, great. And since you mentioned it, let's talk about cartilage. All right, so in red today, I'd ask you guys to have the three primary colors on your table. Um, we are going to talk about cartilage. And cartilage is, you know, folks know that it's in their nose and in their ears, but it's also um, mostly found in between the joints. Um, so everywhere two bones, two or more bones come together, you have cartilage. Um, the job of cartilage is to absorb shock. So it's kind of like a padding. And when you think about this sensibly in reference to evolution, um, so an adjective describes bones as if they are hard. They are hard. And if you rub two hard things together, what happens to them? Friction. Yeah, heat up, there's friction, right? Um, or you could, you could even shave off or break or damage part of the bone. So what this cartilage acts as is an intermediary. It's a small cushion, a uh, small fluid-filled cushion, which allows these bones to kind of be moving against each other, but not actually um, grinding on one another. Um, a lot of athletes sustain damage to their cartilage. Folks have heard of a, of a meniscus tear before, um, damaging the cartilage of your knee joint, perhaps. Um, in that case, that athlete or uh, person that, that happened to, the bone of their femur, their leg bone, and the bone of their um, tibia and fibula might be rubbing up against and causing friction there. Yes? Yeah, of course. It's right there. Damn. Um, Next up in yellow, we have our ligaments. Now, like our cartilage, our ligaments do connect bone to bone, but unlike our cartilage, which is in between the bones, our ligaments wrap around the outside of the bones, tying them together. Um, so very similar to how like your shoelaces tie together these two flaps, right? The ligament would connect each side um, and keep the whole thing from happening. Now, sometimes people get, um, Rotator cuff injuries, football players, this happens to very often. Um, more so it's have what's known as a natural range, right? So like, we can all take our arms and kind of put them back this way, and some people can like go all the way back, and some people only a little bit. What would happen if something exerted force on me beyond my natural range, like my arm is like way back? All right, there's gonna be an injury, right? And what happens is these ligaments which are flexible, but by no means like a rubber band, can only stretch to a certain point before they tear or break. So when that tearing or breaking occurs, you have an injury. Now there are not a lot of blood vessels connected to ligaments. Can folks tell me what do blood vessels bring to cells in the body? What does blood have in it? Oxygen and? <laughs> Nutrients, right? So if you don't have a lot of blood vessels, and you don't have a lot of nutrients, is the ligament more, more or less likely to heal? So if it has an absence of uh, blood getting to it, so it's fewer nutrients, less oxygen. Less, right? So if people damage a ligament, right, it may take a very long time to heal, or it may not heal at all. It might be scarred, um, and you know, as a professional athlete, that might be the end of your career. Um, so what do we always tell folks to do before you exercise? Stretch, right, to get these things warm and at their fullest extension. All right, last up, we'll talk about tendons. We're doing that in blue. All right, so tendons are, just like the other two, a fibrous tissue, a tissue containing many small fibers. And tendons connect bone to muscle. So yesterday we talked about how every time a muscle shortens, bones get moved. And this tendon is what anchors the muscle to the bone. Thank you. 
Um, all right, so we've got uh, one more small batch of notes, then we'll do a draw a nice little picture. Um, but for now, let's talk about our last heading, regions of the skeleton. So um, most organisms that have an endoskeleton, the bones on the inside of their flesh, have a centralized area known as the axial skeleton. Um, and um, Ashley, what does our Earth do on its axis? The imaginary line that runs to the center of the Earth. What is the Earth doing on its axis? It's what gives us night and day. It rotates, right? It spins on its axis. We also have this ability, right? So I have an axis, I have a center point to my body, and I can rotate on that axis. So if you remember, we did a rotation exercise yesterday um, at the end of class. Um, also, the axial skeleton's job is to protect the central nervous system, um, which we learned about back in chapter one. So, um, oh, Joel, I want to be fair to you. You weren't here in chapter one. Yeah. All right, so, <laughs> um, Amina, Amina, can you remind me what two things make up the central nervous system? One of them is the place where all the thinking happenings. The brain. Oh, Jesus. The brain, right? And the brain collects information from the rest of the body through the, just south of the brain, runs all the way down. Will be on next Friday's test? I didn't hear you. Nope, you didn't, you didn't complete it. There's two words to it. Awesome, great. Great, so the brain and the spinal cord. No need to be shy. We're all friends here. Not um, really. Or here, or at least companions. All right, and essential organs. This goes against what we talked about earlier. Um, Eddie and I had a discussion about this. Um, Gabriella, could you remind me what the, other than the brain, what are the other two most essential organs you did for minute to minute survival? The heart. The heart, awesome. And the lungs. And the lungs. Right, so the, ax, the axial skeleton um, protects all of our most vital and, and important minute to minute life organs. Great. Now, if you're a snake, this is all you have. You have a skull, you have vertebrae, and you have ribs. But if you're an organism like us, that is a um, biped. Remember, what does that mean if you're bipedal? Remember all the way back to chapter two? You got two, you got two leggies, right? So, um, right, so you, so off of your axial skeleton, you'll have the appendicular skeleton. And you may have even heard the word appendages before, right? Appendages referring to your arms and legs. Um, can we see that? Your appendicular skeleton is on the periphery of your exoskeleton. Um, Joelle, have you ever heard of peripheral vision? No. Has anybody? Do we have anyone? Jasmine, do you know what that peripheral vision is all about? It actually, you're, you're, you're using a hand gesture that indicates it really well. You're holding your hand on the what of your head. There's this. Right, so peripheral indicates like perimeter or on the side, right? So we're saying that the appendicular skeleton, the arms and the legs, right, they hang off the sides of the spine. They hang off the sides of the axial skeleton. All right, now, way back in chapter, golly, um, chapter three, we did some drawings where we drew a fin and a wing and an arm and a leg of different animals. What did they all have in common? Does anyone remember? What was the purpose of that drawing? We had that whale fin, and then we had the chicken wing, which we ended up dissecting. They all have the same what? They all have the same bones, right? So folks might remember that whether you were a bird, or a mammal, or a reptile, or a fish, you had a very similar bony structure, where you had some kind of plate, you had one single long bone, two smaller bones, and then multiple bones. Now let's say I was saying to you that this is an arm, right, and this is your shoulder blade. Let's say I were to draw the pelvis and the femur, the leg bone, and the tibia, the lower leg bone, and the fibula, the other lower leg bone, and then the ankle bones and the bones of the toes. Um, what do you notice about these two pictures? They're the same, right? So notice again that we have, 
um, it's the same structure on appendages, whether it's the upper appendages of the arm or the lower appendages of the leg and pelvis. Um, if I were an organism that stood on all fours, right? I had two, I had another shoulder bone and some more um, arm bones there and some more leg bones here. If I got four legs, what kind of organism would I be? I would be a quadruped. Excellent. Wow, so you folks remembered some stuff. Um, all right, so let's uh, move on to our picture and I'll turn the lights up so we can see. Oh, actually, wait, sorry, I got one more thing here. Um, this is just to talk about, just for discussion. Uh, this is from, from yesterday. I'm going to pull on a friend to remind us. Um, I also did mention it again at the beginning of class, so hopefully you got it. Um, Rayana. Um, I not hear it, huh? Yeah, I'm just coming. Um, the number of bones you have in an area, let's say the fingers versus the shoulder, um, how is that related to movement? More bones equals what? More movements. Very nice. Right, so folks might remember that everywhere two bones come together, you have a joint, and at every joint, there's a movement. So this is just for discussion. On next Friday's test, this will be one of the questions. Um, but again, what's important to note is that where there are more bones, there are more joints. Where there are more joints, there are more opportunities to create a movement. This understanding regularly occurs on the MCAS, generally as a multiple choice. Well, they'll ask you the purpose of a joint or what happens at a joint kind of a thing. And as long as you remember that joints and where movement occurs, and that the more joints you have in an area of the body, therefore the more movement. All right, in a moment we'll do a drawing to match our colors from before. And then we'll move on to uh, activity after that that you'll be on your own for. Mm. Right, a lot of folks got number 12 wrong on this last test we just had. So I don't mind sampling the class for this right now. Um, I've gone most of the morning without eating. I was very hungry. I was a little gr grumpy. I had a hanger. And now I've just nourished myself. Which part of the brain regulates homeostasis? That tells me everything's okay now. You've got enough sugar in your system. It meant lower room. Sorry, yeah, we're going to revisit that one soon because everyone got it wrong in the last Friday's test. That is the hypothalamus. Right, Your hypothalamus is the major, major regulator of your homeostasis. So uh, at the mid-year review, we'll talk about that a bunch more. All right, so we've got this picture here, and I'm going to use that as a model, but we're going to draw it together as a group. So um, I know we all get the important understandings. Obviously, I've got here a picture of the arm. Arm. Great. So we're going to start off by drawing each part and labeling them. So right here, we've got a bone. <coughs> um, you guys call it the? The collarbone. But its official name is the clavicle, right? So we're going to draw our clavicle bone first. And then you can see where I'm going with this. I'm going to add these things bit by bit until we get to that final picture. And then we'll put all our colors on there, and it'll be magnificent. And you'll be proud of yourself. Hang out in the fridge and stare at it every day. All right, so um, now the clavicle connects to a bone called the scapula. Um, and what's your common everyday name for the scapula, this guy right here? The shoulder blade, right? So we're going to draw our scalpula next. So again, we're uh, doing a little drawing and labeling together here. Now, the, the next set of bones are actually ones we did label and discuss when we did the lab, the chicken wing lab. Um, does anybody remember the name of the upper bone of the arm? It's sometimes called the funny bone based on its name, actually. What's another word for when something is funny? Hilarious. Tickle. Hilarious. What was that? Is that tickle? Tickles, sure. Um, someone tells a joke, they are very... Hysterical. It can be hysterical. Yeah, they're killing me. Um, um, so folks may remember that this bone is called the 
humorous, right? Humorous isn't like humor, is it funny? Um, uh, all right, so we've got our humorous, the bone of the upper arm. Um, just below that, you have the bone that if you're resting your arms on a table, you feel this long, um, thick bone here. That bone is the ulna. And again, feel free to always look back at your chapter two notes. We had actually drawn and colored these around different animals. And now that I might give you a bottle of a water dropper and cue you at the right moments to shock Eddie into consciousness at the right time. Um, all right, so just next to that, um, next to the ulna is the, the radius. Hopefully folks remember some of this. Um, way back when from chapter two. If not, this is a great opportunity to reacquaint yourself. Um, this exact drawing will be on next Friday's assessment. Um, all right, and that last little set of bones I'm gonna add to the picture, they're not on the original, are the bones of the wrist. Sometimes people get a disorder here called blank tunnel syndrome. Um, arthritis could be a symptom or a cause of this syndrome. Um, folks may have heard of or even know someone who has carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, all right, great. Now, now that we've got our bones down, now that we've got our skeleton, we can start to add on the connective tissues which hold all this together. Um, so in your notes, we have done cartilage in red, so we'll start there. Um, so cartilage is, um, again, this cushion. Where do I find the cartilage again, folks? Where should I be putting the red? between the bones, right? So let's put some here. Let's put some cartilage between the clavicle and the scapula. And let's put a little uh, cushion here between the humerus and the scapula. And also right here between the humerus, ulna, and radius. And then of course also between the ulna, radius, and carpals. And let's go ahead and also fill it in between the small bones of the wrist too. So fill it in between the carpals as well. Right, so again, all of this cartilage is there um, to absorb impact and prevent friction between um, the bones. All right, now the cartilage isn't enough to hold the whole skeleton together. We also need some ties, like some shoelaces to hold the whole thing. Um, so in yellow, um, Um, so taking your yellow, and we're going to um, do some connecting strings called, oops, wait, what is that? There we go. So we can put some, some connecting cords here, connecting all of these bones, right? Connecting the um, clavicle to the scapula, the scapula to the humerus, the radius to the ulna, and then, of course, the radius and the ulna to the carpals. Right, so adding in those ligaments. Um, again, ligaments are uh, one of the major reasons why it's really good to stretch before you do strenuous exercise, right? The more, the more warmed up and supple they are, the less likely you are to sustain an injury um, or become stiff after your workout. All right, so, um, all right, so next up we, oh yeah, we need to draw our muscle before we draw All right, so I'm um, just taking your normal pen, pencil, whatever you're using today, we're gonna draw the muscle next. We draw this guy right here, the bicep, awesome. Right, so you can make that rather large and just put it right on top of your humerus here. So uh, just taking your pen, pencil, whatever you use today and draw yourself a bicep. What does the prefix bi indicate about something? So two of, right? So the bicep has two different tendon connections. Um, so, or uh, it has two heads, I mean, it splits off into two parts up here at the top. So we're gonna draw those up here. Right, so we'll draw one tendon, which we're doing in blue, right connecting the um, bicep to the top of the humerus. We'll draw a second one there, connecting the bicep to the top of the humerus bone. And then we'll also draw one down here connecting to the ulna. All right, great. All right, so you have got your, um, you've got your cartilage protecting the bones from shock. You've got your ligaments 
and your pendants. Um, last up, there should be on most tables purple. Um, I had asked the last group to grab them. If you are absent purple at your table anywhere, let me know. Um, all right, cool. So give you guys one, give you one, give you another one. Alvin, it's time to slap it around a little bit. He's actually sleeping, sitting up. Could you kindly shake him around a little bit, please? It's important to stay right now. You guys are missing too? All right, great. Now what we're going to do is we're going to just box off our joints. Right, so we're going to take um, our purple and we're going to put a purple square around the elbow joint and one around the wrist joint, and then one around the shoulder joint. And once again, just to reinforce what's on the last slide, right, we'll also in our purple um, write the word joint or joints, right? We're just making a box around it. You don't have to shade it in, but you should have a purple square um, showing that. Also writing the word joints in purple. And lastly, um, just reinforcing that this is the site of movement. So this is where movement occurs. All right, cool. And that completes our connective tissue drawing. Um, so what we're going to do next is, um, in your notebook, you guys create a little mini poster. You might remember back in chapter one, we did the nervous system. I had you guys draw, or I played this BBC website game. We connect different parts of the body and shows you the nerve connections. We're doing the same today with bones and muscles. So I've got two examples here um, that I put together. I played the game myself and put together um, some examples of what your final products will look like. So I'll discuss how that happens and then I'll unleash you um, to your own devices, right? So you've already got some colors at your table. You just need two of them, one color for your bones, one color for your muscles. You'll go to the BBC website. Um, you'll play the skeletal game. As you play the game, It'll give you the names of bones and show you how to draw them. You'll put them into your body, give their name, and describe what they're there for, right? So, for example, um, you know, we have the clavicle here. The clavicle, clavicle is a bone that stabilizes the shoulder joint, right? So, um, so feel free to look at my examples before you get started. Otherwise, computer cards right back there. I think I unlocked right before class. And uh, you're off and running. Feel free to work alone or with a partner, either side. Yeah. 